righty now. Come on. Hold on, folks. I'm trying. Let's see if I can do a lot. One second. Okay. Let's see if I can go live. Hold on. I guess I'm live. Am I live? Let's see. Let's see if I'm live. Live. Hey guys, we're live, huh? Let's see something. Let's go here. Man, I'm just trying my new computer. Let's see if it works. I guess it's working. Let me see. Hold on, folks. Hold on. Let me see. I am live. Okay, good. Now I know how it works. I am live. Okay, good. Now I know how it works. Hey, fellas, what's up, man? What's up? Sorry, now you got to see my very sexy self. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. What's going on, fellas? Okay. Let me let people know that I'm on. Sorry, I was just testing my new Mac. And so we're going to have to wait a little bit. We're not in the, uh, how are you, brethren? Hold on. I don't know. All right, hold on. Sorry. Give me a few minutes, folks. It's because I just, you know, didn't think I was able to go live. Okay. Just hold on. Let's see if we can get people coming in. Let's see. Sorry about the bad lighting, man. And I got my Bruce Lee shirt again. All right. Weird, huh? Now I know how to go live. I was wondering how do I go live. Now I know. How you guys doing? It's been a while. Now that I got the new Mac, thanks to your... <clears throat> Donations by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's see. Where am I? Where am I? Okay. All right, fellas. Let's see. Do we have the regulars here? What's going on, folks? Sorry about that, man. Come on. Get my muscles back. Come on now. All right. We got to get my muscles back. Come on. We got to get back in the gym by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's see. All right. I want to know if we got any of the other regulars here. Yeah. So I got to get my definition. Pray. I got 50 more to go by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I figured out how to go live. I actually figured out how to go live. And so we'll see. If we get enough of the regular faces joining me, I'll discuss. I'll probably have to. Let me see. Hold on. Joshua Lingle, I don't know what you're talking about. I already wrote an article, did a, did a discussion on that. Yeah, I got to get my definition. I got 50 more pounds to go, so pray for me by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get my health back. I'm, you know, I'm doing very well by his grace and mercy. Yeah, I, I'm probably going to delete this video because this was just the test, so I'll try to come back on. Uh, Gloria, I have more than one daughter. I have two precious angels. I have two, two angels. I have a nine-year-old, Soraya, and... A six-year-old is going to be seven, Zipporah. To be honest with you, I got destroyed today in the court. Put it this way, yeah, because you said your daughter. Someone's asking me, Henry. Henry, I got 60 days to come up with an astronomical amount that is unfair. The reason why it's unfair is because this corrupt, wicked judge is ordering me to pay the legal fees of my ex-wife. Now, it's one thing to pay my own legal fees, but to order me to pay her fees, which is unjust and wicked and evil, and I got 60 days or I'll be in contempt of court, and I can't, I can't afford it. I don't have the money. So to be honest with you, I don't care. It's in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He is risen. He's alive. I belong to him. So if the Lord Jesus wants to get me out of it, his will be done. If the Lord Jesus wants me to suffer 
<clears throat> penalties, his will be done. I can't fight the system. In other words, this is a system that only God can fight and destroy. Because if you try to fight the system, you're going to lose and you're going to sin against the Lord Jesus. So <clears throat> I'm not going to shame the Lord Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit sealing me, by the power of the Holy Spirit preserving me, by the power of the Holy Spirit sanctifying me. <clears throat> For the glory of Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to take matters into my hands. I can't. I won't. I'll lose. And I don't want to bring shame to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to love Jesus more than anything. And if this is something I have to go through, as will be done. Just put it this way. What she's asking me to pay in 60, di uh, 60 days, it's going to take a miracle. And I don't pay it and won't pay it because it's not fair. She accrued those attorney fees, right? It's not fair. All I want is to start a new chapter in my life, focus on Jesus Christ, focusing on becoming more like Jesus, becoming more holy, more self-discipline, more loving, more compassion, more filled with fruit of the Spirit, life of the spirit to know the word more live it more perfectly proclaim it magnify the name of jesus and to raise up my children uh email email jacks you don't know this judge she shut down my attorney and even though we showed everything that my ex actually makes more than me she didn't care she goes don't believe it don't want to see it because she thinks i'm a liar right so you don't know this judge. In fact, if you want to find out how corrupt this judge is, e Emei Jax, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Emei Jax, you're not listening, my friend. Let me try this again. Go do a search for Judge Jean Marie Reynolds. She's notorious man-eater. She destroys men. There have been petitions to remove her, but because the system is so corrupt, she remains a judge. Yeah. Image. Well, uh, the way you spell it, you spell it wrong. So please... Don't tell me what to do when I already got a lawyer. We did that. It's not as simple as you make it out. Maybe in your world it's simple. It's not. Yeah. So, but anyway, let's see if enough people show up. You know, anyway, I don't want to focus on negative. I want to focus on Jesus Christ. I want to focus on his beauty and majesty. And I need your prayers. Ask the Lord Jesus for the following. The number one, I become more like Jesus, more patient more loving, more compassionate, much more holy, much more worshipful, filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Just to worship Jesus, love Jesus, obey Jesus, live for Jesus. Number two, that the Lord Jesus will help me to get my health and keep my daughters perfectly healthy and safe and provide overly abundantly for them. And number three, to finish the race that I've begun for his glory, right? To continue preaching and teaching. He doesn't need me. I'm expendable. We, I, I need him, so... Yes, and this is by by chance. I, I I'm streaming streaming right now because I was trying to see how I can work this new Mac, figure it out to start streaming. All right. So again, I didn't announce this. Now I know how to use the Mac. Now I know how to go live, and Lord Jesus willing, I'll be going live more often. Right. So I'm here, even though I titled it the Gospel of Jesus Christ Part Two. I pray that you get the close. Oh, man, they've been trying, ma'am. Two four one, two four one. Judge Jean Marie Reynolds. Just look her up. There's even a Facebook page that says Judge Jean Marie Reynolds must go. They've been trying, but the Illinois legal system it's so corrupt. The corruption is in the highest levels. It's going to take a miraculous act of God, right? Yes. So I don't know. I may teach right now. Let's just see. I may have to delete this because I don't want to go too much into my legal issues because put it out there. Put it this way. There are people out there who hate me. And some of them have reasons to because I've offended them. I've attacked them because I'm not very gracious in attacking heretics or blasphemers. Right. So they're going to use anything to attack me. And at the same time, I don't want to come off as sounding like sour grapes. Put it this way. I asked the Lord Jesus to wash my heart, to forgive my ex-wife. And I ask the Lord Jesus to forgive her and transform her by the Spirit to repent because she's living a path of destruction and she won't last. She's going to come under the severe discipline and chastening of the Lord, and she's already being disciplined and exposed. The thing is, I have two daughters with her, and I don't want something to happen to her because it'll affect my daughters. God, forgive me for being selfish. And at the end of the day, 
She's a vapor. I'm a vapor. She's going to die and face Jesus Christ. So being married to me means nothing. You being married to your partner means nothing because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're going to die. We're going to stand before Jesus Christ. And our marriage is not going to be the grounds of our salvation. Our marriage is not what saves us, right? Jesus saves us. And if we don't submit to the Lord Jesus, confess our sins, and ask the Holy Spirit to give us the power to live holy unto the Lord, we're going to hell. We will be cut off from the Lord Jesus Christ with everlasting destruction. Yeah, so 75, good. Hey, I guess people are showing up. Now I'm just waiting for my friend, Protestant re uh, reformer. Is he here? Halima, I don't know, right? Pray for me, you know, I don't know. Yeah, ambassador, yeah. And I'm gonna put it out there because listen, I don't want this to come out of slander. It's not. I am a public minister, so I'm in the public limelight. And like I say, those who hate me will use anything to slander me and attack me. Those who love me will understand and pray that the Lord Jesus has mercy on me and my household. Just again, just to be honest, my ex-wife committed adultery twice, twice with two different men. The first time I went back for the sake of my daughters. The second time was with a married gym rat whose wife left him and she pretty much destroyed our family and left me homeless to have this affair, but it didn't even last for a year, about a year and it was over and it's too late. She destroyed the family, destroyed my children, left me homeless and a corrupt legal system punished me for her sin. A corrupt legal system punished me for her sin. You believe it? Yeah, that's what happened. Two adulterous affairs. And I'll be honest, I stuck around the first time for the sake of my kids. And in all honesty, if I think about the damage is done to my kids and how I'm not with my kids and how they, they suffer because their father is not in their lives, yeah, I can get angry and be hateful towards her. But for the most part, I have no hatred towards her because I've asked Jesus to heal my heart for her destroying my family, my children, and that the Lord Jesus has mercy on her, honestly. Right? And I'm not the only one. So I'm not trying to play victim or a martyr. I'm not the only one, saints. I am not the only one. <clears throat> there are many in ministry you don't know about who unfortunately their spouses have left them for other men. And also it happens to women. You don't know how common it's become among Christians serving Jesus that their families are being destroyed by Satan. It is unbelievable. I haven't seen this to this extent because what I'm seeing, the pattern, and it's not always the case. I'm seeing now women leaving their husbands for men they meet in the gym. And that's one common thread I've noticed. Where do they find their adulterous partners? In the gym, working out. So keep praying for me. And let me be honest. Let me be very upfront and frank with every one of you. I've never been happier. I've never been healthier. I've never been closer to Jesus Christ. Yes, I have my shortcomings because I too struggle. I struggle sometimes with loneliness. I struggle with carnal desires. I'm being honest. I'm not Superman. I'm not trying to be something I'm not, nor do I want to be unnecessarily offensive to you and cause you to stumble. But I'm a man like all men with needs. And I have carnal desires that I ask Jesus to give me the grace to crucify. But apart from that, I've never been closer to the Lord. I've never had more doors open for ministry. I've never traveled as much. I've never been happier. I've never been healthier. I'm more alive than I've ever been within the last 12 years. It was not a marriage from God. You know, the Bible says what God brings together, let no man separate. But not every marriage is an act of God. Not every couple that join together as one flesh is because God brought them together. At times, our own sinfulness, impatience, impatience right, <clears throat> causes us to unite with someone that we shouldn't be united with. And you find that in the scriptures, don't you? For example... It wasn't God's will for Abraham to sire a child from Hagar. 
That was Sarah's shortcoming. That was Sarah's impatience. That was Sarah's imperfection and Abraham's lack of trust and patience on the Lord. But still, though Abraham did that, God still blessed the child Ishmael and honored the child Ishmael for the sake of his father. So when God brings two people together and unites them, no man has the authority to sever them. But that's the question. That's the question. Not everyone who unites to another is doing so because God is bringing him or her together, right? I'm trying, Joseph. I went from 340 pounds. I'm down to 250s. Pray I go down to 220, slim and get my muscles back because I want to get my health back, get my life back, and I want to be holier than I've ever been for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? And again, let me just praise the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I ask that you wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ and wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ. And please, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh and the fruits of our flesh and fill us with life, fruit, power, wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit to walk in holiness and purity because I need that, Father. I need that, Lord Jesus. I need that, Holy Spirit. We all need that. And Father, if you're pleased to use me, anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, to speak it clearly, and make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And Father, please fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life so that I can have the health to continue to glorify and bless everyone by the power of the Holy Spirit to understand these things and enable me to speak truth for the glory of Jesus because we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save our families. In my case, save my daughters in Jesus' name. Okay. I was hoping Protestant would be here, but he's not here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to just read the Bible for, for tonight's session. Like I said, this was a test run. Now I know how to live stream. Pray that now I can regularly start updating <clears throat> my YouTube page with short discussions and lengthy sessions on core doctrines, topics that are important and vital for us to know and understand for the glory of Jesus Christ. Someone said, allow him to speak as long as he doesn't talk. I don't get it. Next writer, Sam, do you have an email so I can send me a message? You mean send me or you? Saint, that's a little technical discussion. I can send you an article that I wrote. It did take place on the Passover, but there's no contradiction between what Mark and John says. So Lord Jesus willing, maybe in the future I'll do a session on it, but I can send you an article. If you want my email to contact me, either you can do so on my social media pages, Facebook, or you can just email Sam, S-H-M-N, at yahoo.com. Sam. S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. Yeah, I, even though I titled it The Gospel of Jesus Christ Part 2, I wanted to continue where I left off previously when we were discussing The Gospel of Jesus Christ where I unpacked Genesis Chapter 3. But usually I have Protestant Reformer on. He's not here. Let me just tell him I'm on. Maybe he can come and post verses for me because he's the brother. His name is Orbiter Protestant Reformer, right? Let me just see if I can get him on. Let me just see. Sorry about that. Let's see. All right. Hey, First Last is here. Good, brother. I just sent you a text. First Last, are you capable of putting putting Bible verses or no? David who? David Wood? Yeah, the longer ending of Mark is genuine scripture. It's inspired scripture penned by Mark. Good, we got a 111. All right. So we can probably get into the groove of things by the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll wait for you, I guess. I'm waiting for Orbiter to show up. Anyway, that makes it easier for me if someone posts the verses or I can just bring my Bible and read. But someone was asking me about David Wood. Was it David Wood? Because someone said 
David. Well, David Wood's doing fine. He's doing great by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, what's up, idiotai apologetics? What's up, my friend? Yep, this is a test run because this is the new Mac. And I wanted to see <clears throat> if I could do live streams on this new Mac. And I finally figured out. Now I know how to do it. What about Mark 12, 30, 32? You're kind of confusing me about Mark 12, 32. There is no God but he. Pistol Pete, you don't need to be unnecessarily offensive by calling Muslims retarded. There are some Muslims that are dogs and you can treat them accordingly, but Muslims in general, you should treat with respect and kindness, right? Ontolog ontologics, yeah, that would be discipline on his part. Yeah, I think that's that's self-evident just reading the context. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do right now. This is impromptu. I can stick around and teach, or I'm just going to use you know use this opportunity to get acquainted with how to go live on this new Mac, and we'll probably start tomorrow. Okay. No, Rajad Das, I'm not going to explain Mark's ending. You asked me the question. It's original to Mark. There's plenty of evidence showing it is. I suggest that you look up James E. Snap Jr. He has written a thorough defense of Mark 16, 9 to 20 being part of what Mark originally wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Do you want to take questions? While yes, go ahead. If you guys want to ask me questions, go ahead. And I'll see which one to answer. But still, that requires someone quoting Bible verses for me. And I can bring my Bible and start reading. All right. Seeking truth, how are you? Maybe talking about Lord's Supper, who should take it, who should not. Man, You guys are asking a lot of excellent questions. And the only reason why, the only reason why I'm hesitant to get into some of these questions, because these are questions that require lengthy explanations. How long have I been saved? As long as Jesus has saved me. And I pray he preserves me for all eternity for his glory. Oh, Philip said he will. Okay. All right. Philip said he will. The gospel of Jesus Christ, part two. I have a question about being proven. Let me see, Q. A lot of good questions. No, Muhammad Ansari, I not, have no interest to prove that to you. You're not important to me. Go find someone else that will play your games. Sam, S-H-M-N at yahoo.com sam s h m n at yahoo.com okay well i've i've actually addressed mark 12 32 in context on more than one occasion this keeps coming up so what you need to do is go and read the articles on answeringislam.net answeringislamblog.wordpress.com and read the articles, do a search for Mark 12, 28 to 37, or also on my YouTube channel, I went in-depth on Mark 12, 28 to 37, where Jesus says, here is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Did he mean that God is one person or a multi-personal being? Zena, what's your question? You, I think you had sent me an email, but I was going to tell you, don't email me, Zena. Text me if you have a question so I can give you the answer via phone. Not writing because it takes too long for me to write a response. I'd rather speak to you on the phone and give you the answer or send you a voice text if possible. But don't ask me to write a written response. It takes too long. I don't have the time, unfortunately. My brother in Christ says that tongues are a sign as only is and the only sign that you have the Holy Spirit. But I say that's a true, just a gift of the Spirit, not a sign that you. Uh, well, your brother is quoting specific passages from the books, book of Acts where speaking in tongues was a sign that those individuals had been filled with the Holy Spirit and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right, Q? Okay. Q asked me a question. An orbiter is here. So praise the Lord Jesus Christ is here. He posts verses for me. Okay, guys, slow down. I can't keep up with all the questions. Okay. 
No, Second Peter. It has nothing to do with selling books and all that. Anyway, what do I say about the Eucharist? Are you asking me about the Lord's Supper communion, that the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper? Yes, I believe in that. But if you're asking me, does it become, is it transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ so that the external appearance, the accidents, look like bread and wine, but the substance is no longer the substance of bread and wine, but it becomes the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that's one of the things I don't accept. I reject. I don't believe that. If I did, then I'd be a Roman Catholic. Even though I see a lot of true things in the Roman Catholic Church and a lot of true things in the Orthodox Church, a lot of true things in Protestantism, not any one group in my, my belief, and my belief my knowledge is limited and perfect, and my prayer is the Holy Spirit will perfect me and sanctify me and transform me to think the Holy Spirit's thoughts after him and correct my bad theology. Point being is not everything in all the major branches of Christianity are absolutely certain and correct. There are a lot of things that Protestants hold that I don't see in Scripture. Same with Catholics and Orthodox. I don't believe there's any one church that has the correct and perfect interpretation of every single doctrine or practice found in the scripture. <clears throat> the only perfect interpreter of the Bible is the triune God, and the only perfect Christians are those in glory, and the only perfect church, meaning a church that no longer sins, no longer errs, that church is in heaven, not on earth. Because as long as you are in these bodies of flesh, in which sin resides in our flesh, and we struggle with sin, war against sin. Sometimes we even succumb to those sinful inclinations. You're not going to be perfect until that sinful inclination is completely removed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That Dave McIntosh. I promise in time, if the Lord Jesus wills, if the Lord Jesus is pleased to keep me healthy and keep me holy, purified by the blood of Jesus, filled with the Spirit, I will go in-depth on all these topics because you guys brought up a lot of topics. And I can give you sound bites or I can go in-depth on these topics. As far as giving 10% is concerned, in the New Testament, you will not find a single passage saying you must give 10%. What you find in the New Testament is Paul exhorting Christians to give generously, cheerfully, and even sacrificially. Now, Dave McIntosh, let me explain what that means. Someone can give 10% and, and not even break a sweat. Someone gives 5%, and that's a lot, to the point that that person is struggling to give even 5% because that person doesn't make a lot to begin with, whereas another person can give 40%. Another person can give 50% and still be okay because they make tons of money. So here's where the church commits a great sin. By allowing people who can give more than 10% to get away with giving 10%, and by putting a burden on people who have a hard time giving 5%, forcing them to give 10% when they would struggle with 5% and leaving them <clears throat> in a dire situation. It shouldn't be that way. If you have been blessed abundantly financially, you should give more. And if someone is struggling financially, that person gives as much as he or she can without robbing their family of their basic necessities. You want me there? Now, I need to go in-depth on this and prove my point that there's not a single verse in the New Testament that limits your giving to 10%, the tithe. I know the Old Testament teaches that, right? But the New Testament says give sacrificially, cheerfully, right, <clears throat> and generously. That's taught in the New Testament. I've heard the arguments for, no, tithing is still a New Testament practice. No, it isn't. It's not. But anyway, here we go with Bruce Lee again. All right. Guy Wilkerson, are you the same guy that keeps asking me about Isaiah chapter 7? You want me to 
teach you how to deal with Tovia Singer regarding the Bible in a live session that won't be longer than an hour when it requires hours and hours of in-depth teaching to refute Tovia Singer? You're kidding, right? And even in the in the context of Malachi, it's tithes and offerings. And some will even argue, Dizzle, that according to the Old Testament, they gave a tithe of different items, right? Let's say a tithe of their produce, a tithe of their cattle, and so on and so forth. So in reality, it's more than just 10%. Sorry, Q, because you guys are asking so many good questions. I went off top, topic. Let me come back to, to answering your question, Q. I hope I'm not boring you guys with this because, remember, this is impromptu. I just wanted to learn how to use this Mac and go live on this new Mac by the grace of God. Uh, no, speaking in tongues is not a necessary sign to show that you received the gift of the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's why. I want you to read the book of Acts carefully. Q the one. Read. Start reading the book of Acts today. Tonight, prayerfully, asking the Spirit to guide you and finish it. What you're going to find, right? What you're going to find in the book of Acts is certain occasions in which people received the gift of the Holy Spirit, spoke tongues, and certain occasion when people received the gift of the Holy Spirit and did not speak in tongues. Let me give you the three occasions, cue the one, where people were saved, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and did not speak in tongues. In Acts chapter 8, are you ready? Cue the one. Are you ready? I just want to make sure you're following with me. In Acts chapter 8, read from 26 to 39, the Ethiopian eunuch got saved by the preaching of Philip the evangelist, and nothing in the context shows he spoke in tongues. That's number one. The Apostle Paul got saved and received the gift of the Holy Spirit when Ananias came and laid hands on him. And nothing in Acts 9 shows that Paul spoke in tongues as a manifestation, as the proof, demonstration that he had received the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, and was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the second example. Third example, the jailer. You go to Acts 16, 30 to 34. The jailer and his household... God saved by the preaching of Paul and Silas, and nothing in the context shows that he spoke in tongues or his family members spoke in tongues, but we know they got saved. So three occasions in which people got saved and didn't speak in tongues. Now, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip converted a group of Samaritans, they got baptized, believed in Jesus, didn't speak in tongues until Peter and John came, laid hands on them, right? As they spoke in tongues, yet one of them, Simon the magician, who had believed in Jesus and got baptized, asked Peter and John whether he could buy this ability of imparting the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, may you and your money perish. So here is a person, right, who believed, got baptized, and there's no indication in the text that he didn't speak in tongues. He may, he may have not. But still, that was no proof that he was truly saved and born of the Spirit, right? You with me there? And by the way, note Acts chapter 8. If you just start from reading verses 1 all the way to 25, that's one example of people speaking in tongues. The other example is Acts chapter 2. That's the second example, people speaking in tongues. Acts chapter 2. Now the third example, Q to the 1. Acts chapter 10, when Peter is preaching to Cornelius, it says when Cornelius and his household heard the gospel, if you go to Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48, they spoke in tongues as a sign they received the gift of the Spirit and they were baptized in water. So that's the third occasion. And the fourth occasion is in Acts 19, verses 1 to 7, where a group of the disciples of John had received the Holy Spirit because they had not been baptized in the name of Jesus, right? <clears throat> and they spoke in tongues. So notice, four occasions in which people spoke in tongues, three occasions in which they didn't speak in tongues. Acts chapter 2, Idiota Apologetics. 
Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 20, 25. You start around verse 1, right? Philip then converts a group of Samaritans. Acts chapter 10, specifically 44 to 48, right? Acts 10, Cornelius and his household. And Acts 19, verses 1 to 7. So on those four occasions, people spoke in tongues. But on three other occasions, people who got saved did not speak in tongues. The Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8, 26 to 39. That's one. Acts 9, Paul got saved, but nowhere does the text say he spoke in tongues. Acts 16, 30 to 34. The jailer got saved and his household. Nowhere does it say they spoke in tongues. So it's exaggerated. It's inflated. When I say exaggerated, inflated, when people tell you, see, in the book of Acts, every time... A person received the gift of the Holy Spirit, he spoke in tongues. Or the sign that a person received the gift of the Holy Spirit was tongues, that's actually exaggerated. It's only four occasions in which we find people speaking in tongues as a sign. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. On three other occasions, nothing is said about those individuals speaking in tongues as a sign of their salvation. Is that clear? I think Jenny Lou is going to be banned from my page pretty soon because he's manifesting. Did you get that? Okay, hold on. See, I can see it's like a little delay. Sorry about that. Pray for the internet connection by the grace and mercy of Lord Jesus Christ. Everything goes smooth. Q to the one. Did you get that? Because you asked me the question. I'm going to have to retitle this live stream because it's not about the gospel of Jesus Christ per se, right? Actually, that's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Q the 1. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3 says, No one can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Spirit of God. And he's talking about a genuine confession from a heart regenerated and filled with love and faith in Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Yeah. Well, Philip Rene giving a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, notice that predates the law, right? Philip Rene? Philip Rene asked me about Melchizedek receiving a tithe from Abraham. And then it says, We are all priests. Priests gave 10 of what they got to thy priests. Our priests are okay. No, uh, see, that's the point, Philip Rene. You will find examples that predate Moses. Okay. Predate Moses in which the tithe was already being observed. For example, you just gave Genesis 14, verses 18 to 22, where Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek, thy priest. And then you find in Genesis 28, write this down, folks. Genesis 28, as the Lord Jesus grants me clarity of thought and recall of scripture. Genesis 28, 10 to 22, where Jacob has a dream. He sees what we now call Jacob's ladder, ziggurat, a winding staircase around the building where God is on top of it and angels are ascending and descending. When he wakes up, he makes a vow to God. He says that he'll give him a tenth of everything he owns. So we see that they're observing the tithe even before the law of Moses. Now, some people say, you see, giving a tenth predates the law of Moses so that you can't say it's part of the law of Moses and not binding on us. That's one of the objections, right? I've heard people say that. No, the tithe goes back all the way to at least the time of Abraham. It predates Moses. It's not a Mosaic injunction. It's not a command of Moses. So you can't say it's done away with. It predates Moses, and it's still binding on us in the New Testament. You understand the argument? Because I'm going to shut that down right now. Does everyone understand the argument? Before I move on. I just want to make sure. Yeah, Philip, uh, no, you're distorting the text because Hebrews does not make that inference or application that you do. Just because Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek doesn't mean we give a tithe to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're stretching it and perverting the text because the New Testament will inform us how much we give to the Lord. You can't just take an example from the Old Testament 
and then somehow draw the inference that everything said about Melchizedek automatically transfers over to Jesus Christ so that if Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek, we give a tithe to him. Paul says, no, you give cheerfully, generously, sacrificially. So what you're doing again, Philip, is you're giving people the opportunity to rob God. In other words, a person can give to the high priest more than 10%, but when you say 10%, you give him or her a license not to give what is due to the Lord because if they gave 10% to the Old Testament priesthood or even the Melchizedek, Melchizedek, Melchiz <laughs> say that five times fast, Melchizedekian priesthood, even though their sacrifices were infinitely inferior to the sacrifice of our high priest, Jesus Christ. In other words, if the blood of bulls and goats and calves, blood of bulls and calves, I should say, required 10%, how much more the blood of Jesus Christ? So why are you going to limit it to 10%? And then why are you going to put a burden on people who can't afford 10%? They give 5% and they go broke. They go 5% and they are hurting. Remember Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't put heavy burdens on people that Jesus himself doesn't place on them. Are you with me there? Don't put heavy burdens on people that Jesus Christ hasn't placed on them. So how much do I give? Let's see if the New Testament says something about it. And nowhere in the New Testament... Nowhere in the New Testament does it say, tithe, find it for me as a command upon believers. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, and there we are told by Paul to give cheerfully, to give sacrificially, to give generously. Well, you're not giving generously and sacrificially if you can give more than 10%. But if someone is hurting to give 5%, that person in principle is giving more than you because that 5% hurts. It's a sacrifice, whereas you give 10% and you get away with murder because you can give 30% and still not hurt. So why are you giving people the license to rob Jesus Christ? Yes, I did, Scott Weldon. By the grace of God, I went from 340. I'm down to 250. Pray I go down to 220 and keep it off and get my health back. My looks back and be holy. Pray more importantly, I'm holy unto the Lord Jesus. And I'm single. Look me up. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I am single, but I, look me up. I'm just kidding. All right. All right. Yeah, but Philip Renee, you're talking about a theocratic system in which you had a theocratic community, a covenant community that had to make sure that all its citizens were taken care of, right? But anyway, I'll go in depth on that more later. But now coming back to the issue, what if someone tells you, well, Jacob promised to give a tithe to God in Genesis 28, 10 to 22, specifically verse 22. Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek in Genesis 14. He started 18 to 22. This predates the Mosaic law, showing that the tithe was something observed before Moses so it's not part of the Mosaic system, and it's still binding on us. How do you address that? You guys interested in me addressing it? And we're trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me with wisdom, protect me from error, and anoint me to speak truth for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, have your way and preserve me from error. Okay. Let me get my charger one second, guys. Let me get the charger. It's about to die. Okay. Sorry, guys. Let me get the charger. Hold on. Yep. It's about to die. Okay. Now, how do you address that? Okay, here's the argument, cue the one. Some people will say, in Genesis 14, 18, and 22, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, showing that he already knew about the law of giving the tithe, right? 10%, long before Moses. So did Jacob. 
In Genesis 28, 10 to 22, specifically in 22, Jacob makes a vow to God. He says, I'll give you a tithe, a tenth of all I have. This shows that they knew about the law of 10%, the law of tithing before Moses. And it predates Moses, and it's still binding on us because it's not part of the Mosaic Covenant. You understand the objection? Now, how do you respond to that? Now, you're ready for the response to that if someone uses that against you. Are you ready to respond to that? You want me to give you the answer? Just want to make sure Let me, uh, if you guys want the answer. How can I explain? Okay. This is how you respond. The Leverett Law predates the Mosaic Covenant. The Leverett Law predates the Law of Moses. What do I mean? In Genesis 38, there you find in Genesis 38 the law that if a person marries a woman and dies childless, then his brother must marry her and sire a child for his brother to preserve his line. Because that's what you find in the case of Judah and his sons, Er and Onan, right? Genesis 38. Are you with me there? This is called the Le Le uh, Leverett Law. That's found in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10. Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10. But that law was already known and observed before Moses because we see Judah observing that law. Because when his son got married and died childless because he was evil and God struck him down, he then told his other son, marry your brother's widow, and sire a child for your son to preserve his line. But then it says that son was so evil he'd pull out and spill his seed on the ground because he didn't want to sire a child for his brother. Now, because it predates the law of Moses, which Christian would say that's binding on us? Which Christian would say since the Le 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 Leverett law, the Leverett law predates Moses, antedates Moses, Therefore, it's still binding on us on, uh, as Christians. I don't know of any pastor that would say that. You with me there? So then why then would you say just because the tithe was observed before Moses, somehow that means it's still binding on us in the new covenant. If you're going to go that route, then so is the Leverett law. That means if you are married, you die childless, your brother has to marry her and sire a child for you. I don't know of any pastor that would insist on still observing the Leverett Law. Do you? Do you? What's my point? Here's my point. Here's my point. You need to let the New Testament inform you of how much of the Old Testament, it's ethical, it's ceremonial, it's moral principles, commands, codes, etc., are binding upon you under the new covenant. You with me there? So to go back to the Old Testament and tell me they did X, Y, and Z, that's true. The New Testament presupposes much of the Old Testament, and a lot of the Old Testament is binding on us Christians under the New Covenant. But we need to see what the New Testament tells us about the previous legislation and inform us which parts of the previous legislation is still binding on me as a Christian and which parts are no longer binding upon me because I have been freed, loosed from them. Are you with me there? Did that make sense? Hello, how are you, brother? And Zina, are you still here? Amy, if it's a gathering area in Trinidad, why don't you get lost and stop barking? Because we no one asks you to be here. Hold on, let's let's balk her. An arrogant dog upset that we Trinitarians glorify the true God.
It's clear, everyone? Okay. So let me show you what the Bible says about that. Let me show you what the Bible says about that. About that. Let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Let's read 15 to 18. In fact, let's read Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Matthew 18, 15 to 20. You ready? And thank Orbert, he's going to post. Read with me. The authority that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the New Testament church, specifically the apostles and the prophets, who laid the foundation of the church. Eunice, why as a Muslim do you even care what my thoughts are on Calvinism when the official sources of Sunni Islam teaches hyper-Calvinism? Anyway, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Let's pay attention here. The authority that the Lord Jesus gave to the church, specifically the apostles and the prophets, because they laid the foundation for the New Testament church. Let's read. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, the, hear thee thou hast gained thy brother. If he listens, you've won him over. Right? <clears throat> but if he will not hear, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to be able to pronounce the Shakespearean English of the King James. Now read 17 to 20. Read with me. 17 is the key. Guys, read. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a public man. Treat him as an unbeliever. This fellowship and throw him out. You see, when the church makes a decision, it's binding. Because Christ gave that church the authority to bind and loose people and to disfellowship them if they're not walking in orderly <clears throat> obedience to the commands of the Lord. Now, note, notice 18 and 19. Guys, pay attention to this. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. This is the key, 18. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, okay, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you see what the Lord said? You, the church, specifically you, the apostles, you, the prophets, are going to work with the apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you bind has been bound in he heaven. That means what they bind Christians to. What you loose Christians from shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, he has given the church specifically those who laid the foundation of the church, the apostles and the prophets, the authority to say, you, Christian, are bound to X, Y, and Z. You, Christian, have been loosed, loosened from X, Y, and Z, or A, B, and C. Let me read on to 20. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that shall ask, see, if two of you agree, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, what is our Lord saying? Let me explain what, what our Lord is saying here. He's saying, when you, specifically the apostles he's addressing here, come together and decide, no, I'm in the midst of you. No, I'm overseeing you. No, I'm watching over you. No, by my spirit, I am moving you to arrive at a decision. One second. Let me muzzle another dog who's twisting scripture to a shame and destruction. All right. You with me there? Did you guys get it? You understand what our Lord is saying? Our Lord is saying, because I'm the midst of my church, I'm the midst of my congregation, I'm the midst of my people, I oversee the affairs of the church, right? I superintend the church. I oversee the church. I'm in the midst of you and with you, and I move you and guide you to arrive at a decision. Do you agree? Do you understand now before I move on, right? Zena, I hope you do. Let me make you an admin. Hold on, Zena. I just did, sister. You're an admin. Okay, is that clear? So did you get understand what Jesus is saying? That means if the apostles come together and say, you Gentiles, we loose you from circumcision. 
you Gentiles, we bind you to <clears throat> water baptism. You Gentiles, we loose you from observing Sabbath. You Gentiles, we bind you to sexual purity. Guess what? You're bound to do what they tell you to do, and you're free to stop doing the things they tell you you don't need to do. You hear me there? Now let me show you that from the Lord's words to Peter. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, we'll start at 15, and we'll read to 19. Matthew 16, 15 to 19, but the key verse will be 18. It will be verse 19, I'm sorry. Key verse will be 19. Matthew 16, 15 to 19, key verse will be no resurrected eyes. It has nothing to do with spiritual authority. If you mean by casting out demons, no, that's not what he means. He's talking about making decisions in regards to church. Specifically in that context, he's talking about church discipline. Because what was the context? If your brother sins against you, if your brother is at fault, show him his error, his fault, privately. And if he accepts, you won your brother over. If not, bring two or three witnesses. And if he still refuses, bring him before the church. And if he still refuses to repent, this fellowship him, treat him as a heathen unbeliever, get rid of him, throw him out of the congregation. It's in the context of the church making decisions, affecting discipline and Christian conduct. That's the contextual meaning. So if you mean by spiritual authority, binding demons, it has nothing to do with binding demons in Matthew 18. Resurrect eyes. Why are you misquoting Matthew 16? That again is talking about the authority of the church, the apostles binding Christians to specific commands and observances and loosening them. I know you come from a charismatic background that misapplies these passages. These passages have nothing to do with binding demons or loosening people from demonic oppression. That's not the contextual meaning. Let's read Matthew 16, 15 to 20. The key verse will be verse 19. Verse 19. You don't need to add verse 20. Forget 20. Just Matthew 16, 15 to 19 as the Lord enables me to call scripture. Let's read. Let's read. Okay. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, in Aramaic, Kepha, Greek, Cephas, right? That's why in the New Testament he's called Cephas, <clears throat> Kepha. Here Matthew calls him Petros. And upon this rock, in Aramaic that would have been Kepha, you are Kepha, and upon this Kepha, in the Greek of Matthew it's Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my church. Notice the church again. And the gates of Hades, hell, shall not prevail against it. Now notice 19. Notice 19. Let's read 19. And I will give unto thee, Peter. Here he gives it to Peter. In Matthew 18, verse 18, he gives it to all the apostles. In union with Peter, he gives it to all of them. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So now what did he give Peter? He gave him the keys, but he also gave him the power, the authority, to bind and loose. Bind and loose things on earth that have been bound and loosed in heaven. And that binding and loosening, he also extended to the other apostles. Now the keys were specific to Peter. That he did not give to the other apostles. So if I miscommunicated and gave you the impression that I'm saying even the keys were given to them, my apologies, may the spirit pr protect me from error. What I was trying to say is the second part, the binding and loosening wasn't just given to Peter alone, but given to the apostles who with Peter and the other prophets that Jesus would raise, filling them with the spirit, right? In union with Peter would be binding Christians to observe certain things and freeing them, loosening them 
from certain practices and observances. Is that clear? Is that clear? Before I move on? Before I move on? Everyone got it, right? So what does binding and loosening mean in these contexts? Well, cue the one, keep praying the Holy Spirit fills me with knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and then the power of the Spirit to live the revelations of God perfectly and to be in perfect fellowship and perfect love with the triune God, to perfectly love Jesus. Okay, all right. So in these passages, binding and loosening have nothing to do with binding evil spirits and loosening people from demonic oppression. It has to do with church discipline, church structure, injunctions and commands that all Christians must observe. Now, can you mention an example or examples in the New Testament where we find the apostles and the prophets exercising this authority to bind Christians or loose Christians? From certain injunctions and commands. Anyone? Yes, Jesus is infinitely amazing. Anyone? Before I move on, can anyone give me an example? Yep, cue the one. Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Acts 15 is an example of the apostles with the prophets and the elders exercising their power to loosen Gentiles from certain commands of the Mosaic Covenant, such as circumcision, Sabbath, dietary restrictions. But then they also bound them to certain commands, such as refraining from sexual immorality, Meats offered to idols, strangled with blood in it, right? So did you see in Acts 15? What do you find in Acts 15? The apostles with the prophets and the elders binding Christians to certain commands and loosening Gentile believers from specific injunctions found in the Mosaic Law. With me there? And Tracy, I'm going to now lovingly humiliate you and ban you for being a perverter of Scripture because none of those passages speak about binding demons. Just because you saw demons bound doesn't mean that these texts are speaking about that. But let me educate you before I ban you for making such a stupid comment, okay, and exposing your ignorance. These passages have nothing to do with binding demons and loosening people from demonic oppression. If you weren't a one-verse Charlie and you weren't so emotionally charged and let emotion experience override the sound interpretation of Scripture, then guess what? You would learn a thing or two. Let me show you the passage that you should use, Aunt Tracy, and then you're going to leave my page and never return again. You don't use Matthew 16, verse 19. That shows you don't know how to interpret Scripture. You don't use Matthew 18, verse 18, because that shows you're an ignoramus. You don't know Scripture. Let me tell you what passage you can use. I'm going to teach you something for free, and then I'm going to send you on your merry way. Here's the passage that you can use that Christians have authority to bind demons. Not these passages, but let me educate you, Aunt Tracy, because you assume that I don't believe that Christians have power and authority to bind demons and loosen people from demonic oppression. That's your ignorance because in your arrogance, you think you know Scripture. May the Lord forgive you and forgive me and give us grace to deal with one another. But let me give you the passage. Are you guys ready for the passage? This is the passage you can use. Matthew 12, 29. 
Let me give you the passage. Let me teach you how to make your case for you and not embarrass yourself. Okay? Matthew 12, 29. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? See, that's the passage you want to use, Aunt Tracy. Did you catch it? Matthew 12, 29. Bind the strong man. And in the context, Jesus is talking about the devil being the strong man that Jesus comes to bind and spoil him to take back what the devil stole from us. Do you see that, Ann Tracy? If you're patient and didn't attack me, you would learn. Now, let me give you another one, Tracy, to you so you don't embarrass yourself again. Okay? Luke 10, 17 to 20. You see, Tracy, what happens when you assume and you attack me instead of being gracious and patient with me? So I can teach you what passages to use to prove this doctrine, that we have authority from the Spirit by the power of the blood of Christ to bind demons and cast them out. Luke 10, 17 to 20. See, if you guys were to be able to control yourselves and be a little humble, I am sure that by the grace of God's Spirit, the Lord could use me. He doesn't need me. I need him to teach you. But you're an ignoramus, loudmouth, which is why I'm certain you're a troublemaker in your church. And if I ask enough members, they'll tell me you're a troublemaker because your mouth and disrespect. But I'm gonna bind, I'm gonna bind you in a minute. Luke 10, 17 to 20. Let's read. Luke 10, 17 to 20. And the 70 return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. That's the passage you use, one verse Charlie Tracy. Or I should call you one verse Tracy, right? And he said unto them, Behold, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now let's read 19 and 20. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. See, Tracy? You see what happens? If you didn't attack me, you're saying, I attack people because I'm insecure. You attacked me. You insulted me because in your arrogance you thought that somehow I deny that believers have the power and authority of Christ to bind demons and set people free from demonic oppression. I didn't say anything of that sort. I said the passages you use are not passages that teach that point. Is that clear? No. The atonement wasn't to pay the devil a ransom. That is blasphemy. I know some people in the church believe that, but don't repeat that heresy, John Williams. You're going to get blocked. Don't be an ignoramus misquoting scripture and saying that Jesus had to pay the devil a ransom for us to be free. Okay, see, there you go again. You and you're telling me to be humble and you can't stop. You have to get in the last word. You have to chime in and attack. Instead of proving me wrong and responding with a gentle answer and turning the other cheek. Why don't you try it and see if that will work? Yeah, I know, Aunt Tracy. Stick the knife in my back and tell you, tell me I love you. Oh, Sam, I love you. Er, Sam, I love you. <laughs> I wonder what you do to me if you hate me. Okay, anyway, Tracy. Lord bless you, sister, and the Lord Jesus. Help us to be patient with one another for the glory of Christ. Okay, now, Luke 10, 17 to 20, that's the passage you'll use that we have authority over spirits. Now, let's go back to Luke 10, 19 real quickly. And Tracy, unless you're a psychologist or a psychi psychiatrist, don't be concerned with my behavior. Be concerned with your attitude, how you egg people on to make them sin and be a stumbling block. So I'm concerned with your attitude and your false sense of piety and concern. So stop it while you're ahead. Or I'm going to block you. So stop. Okay. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, again, 
Jesus's words are significant because he's now announcing the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready for me to unpack Luke 10, 19? When Jesus says, I've given you power to trample on scorpions and serpents, Jesus was announcing the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. Obviously, he's not talking about literal serpents and scorpions because even unbelievers, Muslims and atheists, can trample a scorpion under their feet. Scorpions and serpents refer to demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, Satan and his fallen angels. That's who Jesus is referring to. Are you with me there? That's who Jesus is referring to. He's referring to Satan and evil spirits, the kingdom of darkness. I've come to give you power to destroy the kingdom of darkness, to destroy unclean spirits, to destroy demons. And in announcing this, he is announcing the fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Yeah, focus on me. Don't let Satan use people to distract us. Here, Jesus is saying, I have come to fulfill the promise. Genesis 3.15. Let's look at it. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee, he's talking to the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Did you catch it? Jesus, Jesus, our Lord, appearing to Adam and Eve. This is the Lord God who appeared to Adam and Eve, Jesus. And he says to the serpent, I want to put hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and her seed shall bruise your head. Luke 10, 19 is the fulfillment of this promise. Did you catch it? Luke 10, 19 is the fulfillment of the promise. And what is the promise? It's not Jesus in isolation. It's Jesus in union with his church, through his church, crushing the head of the serpent. See, people think it refers to Jesus alone, like you the one thought. No, it's Jesus in union with his spiritual body, the members of the body of Christ, empowered by Christ, who will destroy Satan and crush him under his head. So who is the seed of the woman? Christ and the church. The seed is not just one individual. The seed is Christ and his spiritual body, the members of his body, the church, you and I. Let me further prove it. You want further proof? Romans 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. Yep, so real that he deleted one of the videos where he got educated and corrected and then record our third discussion where he got educated about Jesus being Jehovah. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Did you catch it? Paul says to the Christians at Rome, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the feet of all you believers. Do you catch it? So it's not Jesus alone crushing the head of Satan. It's Jesus through the church. Jesus in union with the church. The body of believers, born of the Spirit, united to Christ, empowered by Christ to crush the head of Satan and all evil spirits under our feet. Okay. So that promise is not just about... That promise is not just about <clears throat> Jesus... It's about the church of Jesus Christ in union with Jesus Christ, empowered by Jesus Christ, 
to destroy Satan and his kingdom. Do you want further proof? It's referring to the church and unity with Christ. Do you want me to unpack Revelation 12 for you guys? Revelation 12 is an inspired commentary on the promise of the woman in conflict with the serpent. Emmanuel, no one said it's not the first messianic prophecy. So it's not necessarily a double entendra. It is a messianic prophecy because it's Christ who's going to give believers the power to destroy the serpent. Even when you look at the Jewish interpretation of Genesis 3, if you read their commentary, they don't limit the seed to the Messiah, but they say that all the Torah observers will crush the serpent in the days of King Messiah. So even the Jews interpret it not just as Messiah alone, but as Messiah in union with the righteous who observe the law. Is that clear? Do you guys want me to unpack Revelation chapter 12? I can, because Revelation 12 is John's inspired exposition of the conflict and war between the woman and the serpent. Is that clear? Okay. Here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. Slow down on the texting and let's get Revelation 12 ready. Just give me one second. Let's get Revelation 12 ready. We're going to unpack it. Hold on. Okay, let's look at the first six verses of Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 6. Slow down on the texting so you can read with me. Revelation 12 is an inspired exposition of the conflict between the woman and the serpent, and Revelation identifies who that woman is. So let's begin. You guys ready? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, David Wood is wonderful. All right, let's just make sure. Yep, there is a delay. Hold on one second. I'm going to wait for a few minutes. Uh, keep, people keep asking me whether Chris and I are friends. It's not that I'm not his friend. He got offended and cut off ties with me, but then he did something that was very bad. The second discussion where he admitted his error regarding soul sleep, and we talked about Jesus having a flesh body, he deleted from his YouTube page. That was dishonest of him because I didn't have a copy of that discussion, a fruitful discussion. And then we had a, a conversation on Skype that I thought he recorded where I was correcting his response to me when I claimed that Jesus is Jehovah God. So I corrected him and refuted him, and he didn't record it, unbeknownst to me, because I was on a Skype channel. So that was very dishonest of him. That caused me to lose respect, but I still pray for him that God will bring him to the fullness of the truth. Now, now that we've gotten that out of the way, Let's go back to, yes, Dina, he had it on his YouTube page. We had an, a discussion for over an hour, and he admit in that discussion he was wrong, and he stands corrected. He's going to change that doctrine. He still didn't change his doctrine about Jesus being in the flesh. So it was on his YouTube channel. I linked to it. He deleted it. Did you know that he deleted it? Then I had a third discussion because he produced a response to my claim that Jesus is Jehovah of Malachi 3.1. And in that discussion on Skype, I refuted him and corrected him. And then I said, okay, is it recording? He goes, no, I didn't record it. I didn't know you wanted it to be recorded. Can you believe that? I trusted him to record it and put it on his YouTube page. So those two things really caused me to lose respect for him. But God had mercy on him and bring him to the fullness of the truth and correct me and sanctify me for the glory of Christ. Now, with that said, let's go to Revelation 12. Slow down on the comments. 
I want you to read with me because Revelation 12 is John's inspired exposition of the woman and the serpent. Branslop, he didn't need to make a verbal agreement to record it when the previous talks on Skype were recorded. So unless he told me he wasn't recording, I'm going to assume, as was his habit, that he was going to record that discussion as well. But he caught me by surprise. All right. Our brother James says he's got that video on his YouTube page. Share the link. Okay, now, Revelation 12, verses 1 to 6. Let's read, guys. Guys, you're not going to benefit if you don't read the verses. So focus on the verses. Focus on the exegesis. Don't be distracted. Let's start. First six verses, Revelation 12, as the Lord gives me clarity of thought to articulate these truths. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Pay attention, sun and moon under her feet. And up upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So remember, a woman... In heaven, sun and moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars. Don't forget that. Okay. And she being with child, cried, travailing. Now pay attention to the word travailing here. Pay attention. Okay. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. So she gave birth in labor pains. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, uh, upon his heads. Okay, now let's keep reading. <clears throat> and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which is ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the woman was going to give birth to a child, a male child. The dragon wanted to devour it. Now verse five and six, read with me. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, we know that's Jesus, right? The male child she gave birth to is Jesus. He was caught up to God the Father on God the Father's throne where he reigns. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Notice wilderness here where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, meaning a thousand two hundred sixty days. Now. Let's break it down. Pay attention, guys. A woman, sun and moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars, gives birth in labor pains, right? Labor pains, right? A dragon wants to attack her and destroy her. She gives birth to a male son who then is taken to God to be protected from the dragon, devouring him, and that male son sits on God's throne in heaven. Now, who's the dragon? Let's read Revelation 12, 9. Let's read Revelation 12, 9. Let's read. Let's see who the dragon is. Okay. Revelation 12, 9. Let's see. You're in the wrong channel, Severinus. You want to know why God exists or the proofs for God? Go to another channel to deal with atheism. Don't change the subject. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. That old serpent, hmm, called the devil. And Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Did you catch it? The woman, the dragon. The dragon is the old serpent. That's the first clue. Everyone with me? Serpent. Now, John Williams, I, I think you want me to correct you, right? You're ready to be corrected by misquoting Galatians 3.16? If you're saying seed is one person, Christ, that means you don't know Paul and you're twisting Paul. Let me correct John Williams. I'm gonna th I think I'm going to send him on his merry way. He quoted Galatians 3.16 to prove that Jesus alone is the seed. Now, read Galatians 3.29. Galatians 3.29. Let's see what Paul went on to say, which John Williams did not quote. Galatians 3.29. Yeah. So his excuse, I disrespected him for calling him out for his heresy. Cry me a river, Fred. Galatians 3.29. Watch here. Galatians 3.16 was quite quoted. 
Let's read Galatians 3, 1 and. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Did you catch it? Did Paul say Christ alone is the seed of Abraham? Or in context, he said Christ and those who believe in Christ in union with Christ are the seed of Abraham. Did you guys see that? So unless John Williams was trying to argue and refute me, he just got refuted. Because Paul in context says Christ in union with believers who believe in him and are united to him collectively make up the seed of Abraham. Interesting, isn't it? How someone can quote one verse and ignore the rest of the chapter? Quite interesting, isn't it? I am. This is on topic, Animal, by the way, because it shows that the seed is not Christ alone. It further proved my point. The seed is not Christ alone. The seed is Christ in union with the church, the body of believers, born of the Spirit, united to him, clothed with Christ, baptized into Christ. You with me there? Okay, but now, with that said, the dragon is the serpent. Now, remember the depiction of the woman. The woman, sun and moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars. She gave birth in labor pains. Love you, John Williams. I didn't know what you're doing because you caught me off guard talking about the seed when I was talking about the seed. But now, coming back to the issue. This woman has sun and moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars. And she was in heaven, right? Revelation 12, 1 and 2, it says a great sign in heaven. So she was in heaven, right? You guys remember that? Because I want to unpack Revelation 12 and that'll be it for me. My time will be up. Just want to make sure you got it. Okay. Go to Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Thank you, Sound Doctrine. Let's be patient and listen and learn by the grace of God. Let's go to Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Hold on, let me get rid of this guy, this rat. Hold on. This guy's been a nuisance. Hold on. Hold on one second. One second, guys. This guy's been a nuisance. Okay. Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Read with me. Let's see if you make the connection. Guys, read. And he dreamed, Joseph dreamed. Joseph dreamed yet another dream. And told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars made obeisance to me. Sun and moon. Joseph sees sun and moon and 11 stars bowing to him. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, got angry and hated him, but his father observed the saying. Did you guys catch it? Joseph says, I seen 11 stars, which are my 11 brothers, the sun and moon, my father and mother bowing to me. Sound familiar? The woman, sun and moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars. Hmm. Sound familiar? Now, why did Joseph see 11 stars and not 12? Why did Joseph see 11 stars and not 12? Why did he see, oh, you got it, Charles Dickens answered. Because Joseph was the 12th star. So wait, Joseph, 11 brothers make up 12 stars. Jacob and their mother, sun and moon. So when in... Revelation, John tells you a woman in heaven, sun and moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Israel. Did you catch it? No. Benjamin was born, Joel. Benjamin was born in Genesis 35. Joseph is the 12th star, so he's not going to see... 
him bowing to himself. So now when we tie it in, Jacob, his wife, sun and moon, 12 suns, 12 stars, woman. That means John is telling you the woman that it's at war with the serpent is none other than Israel. In other words, Eve in Genesis 3 becomes a picture of the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel is also described as a woman. Are you with me there? Everyone there? And then remember it says that she gave birth in labor pains. See, John assumes that you are familiar with the Old Testament and that you're familiar with the war between the woman and the serpent because he told you that dragon is that old serpent. What old serpent? In Genesis. And then he says the woman, the woman gave birth in labor pains. Well, that's Genesis 3.16, folks. He is now unpacking the meaning of Genesis 3. He's now giving you an inspired commentary on Genesis 3. Let's go to Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3.16. No, worshipers, just be patient. I'll get there. I'll get there. In other words, Eve becomes a picture of someone greater than her. So she's a picture of Israel, right? Genesis 3, 16, I'm waiting. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. And that woman was in labor pains and sorrow, giving birth to the male child, the Messiah, Jesus. And if you still don't make the connection, let's go to Jeremiah 4, 31. And he shall rule over thee, yep. Don't go to sleep yet, Emmanuel. I'm almost done. Yep, one set at a time, King of Kings. Now, Jeremiah 431. Jeremiah 431. 30 days. Okay, let's read. Okay. So put on TV over there. It's my house. I'm going to throw you out. Okay, watch here. For I've heard, Jeremiah 4, 3, a voice of a woman in travail, in anguish, as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion, that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Did you catch it? Israel, Zion, is described as a woman giving birth and labor pains. So now let's tie it in. The... Dragon is the serpent of Genesis 3. The woman with the sun and the moon under her feet and the crown of 12 stars who gives birth to the Messiah Jesus in labor pains is John's explanation of who the woman is in Genesis 3. Although in Genesis 3 it's Eve, Eve becomes a picture of someone else, of Israel. So John is telling you the woman who's at war with the serpent Though it starts off as Eve, later it becomes the nation of Israel. So Eve is a picture of Israel in her war and conflict with the devil. So in Revelation 12, is it about the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother of our Lord? No, it's about the nation of Israel. You with me there? It's about the nation of Israel that gives birth to the Messiah. But does it also include the church? Yes. How do I know? Let's pick it up at Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Cue the one. See patience. You're going to get your answer. Watch here. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Goose asked me a question uh, about Stephen Anderson. Why do I endorse him that jackass sends every homosexual straight to hell? Goose, 
I endorse a lot of people that I don't agree with on every doctrine because I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So there are a lot of good things about Steven Anderson. I praise him for, and he's bold as a lion, but I also condemn him for a lot of things, but that's true with every preacher and teacher, right? If I have to endorse everything a teacher says, then I won't endorse any teacher. But anyway, Revelation 12, 13 to 17, guys, hold on the text so you can read the passages. Read the passages, folks. I don't want you to lose it. Thank Orbiter, our brother, for posting him. Let's read. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child, okay? And to the woman, pay attention, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Tell me if this sounds familiar. This woman was given two wings of a great eagle, right? <clears throat> that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. So she's going into the wilderness. A woman flying into the wilderness with the wings of eagles, of the wings of an eagle. Hmm. Wilderness, a woman, wings of an eagle. Hmm. Being provided for in the wilderness. Now watch here. Let's continue reading. 15. Watch here. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that it might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now here it is, verse 17. In fact, Orbiter, post 17 one more time. Verse 17 one more time. Guys, pay attention. Stop the text and read. 17. Here's the answer. Cue the one. Watch here. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Remember Genesis 3, the woman and her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's your church. John just gave you an inspired commentary of the conflict between the woman and the serpent. The woman is Israel. Her seed are Christians who believe in Jesus Christ. We are the offspring of the woman because the woman, the nation, Israel, gave birth to the Messiah. And when we become one with the Messiah, we become her seed. In other words, Revelation 12 says the battle is between Israel and the church and Satan. And why does it say was given the wings of an eagle? Exodus 19 verse 4. Exodus 19 verse 4. Exodus 19 verse 4. One second. Exodus 19, verse 4. But then I'm going to show you that the woman is a picture of Mary in a minute. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Wow. Israel, the woman, was brought into the wilderness out of Egypt on the wings of eagles or the wings of an eagle. The woman of Revelation also was brought into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle. Do you understand what Revelation is trying to tell you? Revelation is a story of a new exodus, of a new Israel <clears throat> being chased by a new Pharaoh, the serpent, the dragon, who then flees into a new wilderness, and there's a new Joshua that then brings that woman and her seed into a new Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. That's the story of Revelation, which is why the plagues in Revelation are the same plagues that God brought upon Egypt. Did you catch it? You with me there? Now, do you want me to give you further proof that the serpent, the devil, is a new Pharaoh persecuting a new Israel? That's Israel and Christians. United to Christ, going through a new wilderness experience until Joshua brings us into heaven? Why do you think Jesus' Revelation says, I will give him the hidden manna? I will give him the hidden manna. Why do you think the plagues of Revelation are the same plagues that fell on Egypt? Because the entire story of Revelation is a new exodus of a new people of God. I'll show you that it's Mary in a minute. Just be patient with me. 
You want further proof that the book of Revelation is all about a new Israel, a new Exodus, a new Egypt, a new Pharaoh, a new wilderness, a new Moses, a new Joshua, a new Canaan, heavenly Jerusalem? You want further proof? Okay, let's go to Revelation 5, 6. Yep, guys, I need your support because 30 days and 60 days, they're going to try to uh, yeah, prosecute me. But it ain't going to happen because I can't pay and God is good. Anyway, Revelation 5, 6. Okay. Relation 5, 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four lamb of beasts, and in the midst of the others stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Don't take my word for it. Go to BibleHub.com or BibleGateway.com. Look at the word for lamb here. There are two words used in the New Testament for lamb. Okay? Two words used in the New Testament for lamb. There's the word used in John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? That refers to Lamb of any age. Oh, Scott, yeah, call me and we'll talk about it. Big time. And go back and listen to the start of the recording I talk about a little bit. Okay, there's another word, and that's the word used here in Revelation 5, 6. Pay attention here. Guys, follow me. Revelation 5, 6. The word here used by John is a young male lamb, a young lamb, a male. So here Jesus appears as a very young male lamb with his throne, uh, throat slit, but standing. In other words, though the throat was slit, because that's how you, you slay a lamb, he's alive because he's standing, Revelation 5, 6. Do you know why Jesus is appearing as a young male lamb with the throat slit, but alive? Because he's the Passover lamb. Exodus 12, God ordered the Israelites to take a one-year-old male lamb. One-year-old male lamb. Slay it. Eat the meat. Don't break any of its bones. Take the blood. Mix it in with hyssop and bitter herbs and put it on the top and the sides of the door. Then death would pass over the door, not kill the firstborn. And that was the night in which Israel was released from bondage and left Egypt because the Passover lamb had been slain. So you see why Jesus is appearing as a young male lamb? Because that's Jesus' way of signifying to you this is a new Passover of a new exodus of a new people of God leaving a new Egypt to enter into a new wilderness as Joshua then brings us into a new Canaan. Goose tooth, by the grace of the triune God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to recall passages instantaneously, and because that's the work of the Holy Spirit, so he gets the glory for this gift. And which is why Saints trying to take me out of ministry. But he'll fail because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Did you catch it? So why did Jesus appear as a young male lamb? Because he's the Passover. But wait, when the Passover is slain and eaten, that signifies an exodus. Go to 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, and pay attention to verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, and pay attention to verse 7. I'm not done yet. Can you hang with me? I want the numbers to increase, not decrease. I want to get to the point where I can have 10,000 people watching. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, pay attention to verse 7. Danny Zelli, no, in the context, it's the nation of Israel. If you went back and listened to the arguments, you'll see that. But just be patient. I'll show you where Mary fits in. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, specifically verse 7. Read with me. Read with me here. Your glorifying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Notice he's going to use the language of the Passover because they're supposed to eat unleavened bread and remove all the yeast from their homes. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, 
See your unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for, sacrifice for us. Did you catch it? Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. Verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast. Notice the Passover feast, we're keeping it, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Did you see what Paul did? He spiritualized the leaven. Leaven represents sin that spreads and corrupts. Get rid of that leaven. Get rid of sin in your life. Remain unleavened because you're celebrating the Passover with Jesus, the slain lamb, setting us free from Egypt. Do you catch it? Do you guys understand what, you, what Paul just did? He just told you the Passover points to Christ. The reason why the bread was unleavened, even though in its historical context is because to show they're in a rush, they didn't have time to leaven the bread. He says leaven represents sin that if we don't check, will spread and corrupt the church. Get rid of sin when it arises, lets it spreads and corrupts the church. Remain unleavened, meaning free of sin, because you're observing the Passover because Christ the Lamb has been slain, and now we're leaving Egypt, going through the wilderness as we now head towards heavenly Canaan, heavenly Jerusalem. Because our Joshua has come to bring us out and bring us into the promised land of rest. Did you get it? Because now I'm going to show you how the woman is a picture of, of Mary. Are you ready? If you're ready, I'm going to show you now that we're going to conclude. Actually, Exodus 12, 46 is better, Eunice. Exodus 12, 46, because that's about the Passover lamb and not breaking any of its bones. See, Jesus is everywhere, not just in statements talking about his coming. The Passover, the temple, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, Abraham and Isaac, they're all pictures of Christ. Let me show you how the woman is a picture of Jesus. Are you ready? Okay. When Eve ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, was she a virgin? When Eve ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, was she a virgin? Nope. It says none of his bones were broken. If you read John 12 and you read 34 to 37, it says none of his bones were broken. John 12, 34 to 37. Okay. Let's prove that she was a virgin. When did Adam have sex with her and get her pregnant? Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. So, William, it's John 19, 34, 37 to answer your question. Let's read Genesis 4, verse 1 to see. Watch here. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from Jehovah. Notice Adam slept with her and got her pregnant when they're thrown out of the garden, right? You see it? It's in Genesis 4. Genesis 3 is where they sin and get thrown out of the garden. Right? Let's read Genesis 3, 6 to 7. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. Watch here. Watch how Eve becomes a picture of the blessed mother of our Lord Jesus. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. Yep, glory to the triune God. Watch here. And when the woman, notice she's called woman, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So she ate of the fruit of the tree. She was a virgin. She's called woman. Do you notice that woman? 
And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now notice, through a virgin woman, death entered the world. A virgin woman ate forbidden fruit from a forbidden tree and then produced death. Another virgin woman gave birth to fruit that hung on a tree that when you eat of that fruit, you receive life. So one virgin produced death. Another virgin produced life. One virgin woman ate fruit from forbidden tree and brought for death. Another virgin woman gave birth to fruit who hung on a tree that when you eat of that fruit, you live. Let me prove that to you. Go to Luke 1, 42. What are we told about the blessed mother of our Lord? Luke 1, 42. This is why you have to honor the blessed mother of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and not denigrate her just because some people excessively praise her. Give her the honor and love she deserves. Luke 1, 42, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Mary, you're blessed among women, and the fruit of your womb is blessed. Now let's see what happened to her fruit. Go to Acts 5.30. Acts 5.30. Acts 5.30. Yep, Renato, Adam is a type of Christ. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hung, hanged on a tree. Coincidence? Why did Peter say Jesus hung on a tree? Because the Holy Spirit wants you to connect Jesus with Genesis. Here's Mary's fruit hanging on a tree. And that is the fruit of the tree of life. You eat that fruit of that tree and you live. But who gave birth to that fruit? A virgin woman. Acts 10.39 Acts 10.39 Zina, aren't they? And we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So Mary's fruit hangs on a tree. You eat that fruit of that tree, that is the tree of life that brings life. Acts 13, 29. Emmanuel, I don't have time to address that right now. Maybe in a future session. Acts 13, 29. Acts 13, 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. Now, there are two other references to tree. Galatians 3.13 and 1 Peter 2.24. Galatians 3.13 and 1 Peter 2.24. One of the reasons why they emphasize that Jesus hung on a tree is so you can make the connection with the tree of life. So as one virgin, a woman, produced death by eating fruit from a forbidden tree, another virgin, woman, gave birth to fruit who hung on a tree that tree becoming the tree of life, that if we eat of him, we live. Through a virgin came death, through another virgin came life. Galatians 3.13 and 1 Peter 2.24. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now 1 Peter 2.24. Who is his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Coincidence? A woman virgin eats fruit of a forbidden tree and brings forth death. Another woman, a virgin, gives birth to a fruit 
who hangs on a tree, when you eat of that fruit, it becomes life. So she brings life, and he becomes the fruit that makes it the tree of life. Now this explains why Jesus would call his blessed mother woman. Let's go to John 2, 4 to 5. John 2, 4 to 5. Yep, she is our mother. If she's the mother of Jesus and Jesus is our brother, then Mary is my mother. And I love her and I honor her. She is my mother. I adore her. John 2, 4 to 5. John chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Watch here. Jesus said unto her, Woman. Hmm, sound familiar? What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. But now verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now did you catch what happened here? He calls her woman, and there are various reasons why he calls her woman. But one of the reasons is he's calling her woman because the Holy Spirit wants you to make the connection. Here is that woman who has given birth to this fruit, and that fruit will be the one who gives us life. Because he's going to hang on the tree, and that becomes the tree of life. Do you catch it? But now notice how much Jesus loves his mother. Notice how much he loves her. Guys, take a moment. Follow what I'm about to say and pay attention. I'm not getting Catholic or Orthodox on you. I'm getting biblical. We give her the honor that the Bible gives her. Okay, are you with me then? Are you with me now? Even though Jesus said, What's that between you and me? My hour has not yet come. In other words, I work according to God's timetable. God tells me when it's my hour to begin my ministry, resulting in my glorification. But Mary was so confident in her son that her son loved her so much that he would obey her. Notice verse 5 because she's asking him about there being no wine. Pay attention. There's no wine. Even though Jesus in his love mildly rebukes her. Listen, woman. I'm not here to do your will. I'm here to do the will of the Father. Even though he said that, she knew her son so well, she knew he's going to do the miracle because in verse 5 she says, whatever he tells you, do it. Do you see the confidence she has in her son? That she knows her son loves her so much that though... It was in his hour. Because of her request, God would now hasten the hour and says, Okay, son, do it and let the hour begin. In other words, it was Mary's request that began the hour of Christ's ministry. Did you catch it? You see how much the Godhead loves the mother of our Lord Jesus? How much the Father loves her and the Son loves her and the Spirit loves her. That he even told her, my hour is not yet. But because she requested it, the God had agreed to hasten the hour at that moment. Even though my hour is not yet, out of my love for you, I'm going to do as you say. And that was the first of his miracles because of her intercession. John 2.11. Well, I just explained why. Because that's an allusion to the woman of Genesis 3. John 2.11. And then we're going to end it with the final reference. The beginning, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Did you see who hastened the hour? And who was the cause of Jesus performing the first miracle, starting his ministry, his public ministry of signs? The Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the mystery, Samuel. In one way, God is all-knowing and he decrees all things. But another way, things we do on earth can hasten events that God has decreed should come to pass.
It's one of those mysteries we can't fully understand, right? In one way, God knows all things and has decreed what will happen. But in another way, our actions can bring about what God has decreed and hasten it. It's one of those perplexing mysteries, right? And you know who says that? Peter says that. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. Watch here. No, I don't have this in an article yet. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. So it's one of those mysteries how God who knows all things has decreed what will happen, but what you do in time and space can impact the fulfillment of God's decree. It's one of those things that we can't fully comprehend. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. Notice, talking about the new heavens and new earth. Watch here. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation godliness? In other words, you should be holy, obedient Christians living godly lives. Now watch here. Notice what 12 says. Looking for and hasting. Notice, the more godly you live, the faster you'll bring about the coming day of God. Hasting, meaning hastening, bringing about faster. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Did you catch it? Verse 12. The more godly lives we live, the faster we bring about the day of the Lord. We hasten its coming. So you see, we find that with Mary. My hour has not yet come, but because of your request, it begins now. Clear? Yeah, that's again DHC. That's what I'm saying. It's that mystery, right? That tension that God's decree will be fulfilled. It will happen. Christ will return. But in some sense, what we do on earth would hasten it or prolong it. It's one of those mysteries that we won't fully comprehend. But now, let's end it with John 19, 25 to 27. Remember, woman, fruit hanging on a tree. Now, before you post John 19, 25 to 27, yes, it gets worse as far as evildoers are concerned, Zena. But as Christians live holier lives, more righteous lives, pure lives, then the day of the Lord will approach sooner than later. So, you keep focusing on evildoers. Peter's talking about you believers. You believers live godly life, lives, holy lives. Try to be holier. And the holier you are, you will hasten the day of the Lord. Stop focusing on evildoers. Focus on your responsibility and bringing the day of the Lord sooner than later. Yep, he's not tied. That's one of those mysteries. I mean, I can't fully comprehend how it works. We don't catch God by surprise, but somehow what we do in time and space does impact and affect what he does in a genuine way. How does that work? I don't know. It's above my pay grade. Anyway, Orbiter, post Luke 142, and then John 19, 25 to 27, back to back. Luke 142, and then John 19, 25 to 27, back to back. David Wood is somewhere you're not. Stop worrying about him. Yeah, you can thank the Lord Jesus for his blessed mother and honor and love her. We don't worship her. We worship God alone. But honoring her is not worshiping. Anyway, Luke 142, read with me. And John 19, 25, 27, back to back. Read with me, guys. Read. And she spake, Elizabeth, filled the Holy Spirit, spake out. With a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now watch here, guys. Watch here. You got to read John 19, 25, 27. Jesus is the fruit of your womb, Mary. Now notice what happens at the cross. John 19, 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother 
and his mother's sister. So by the cross, the tree, when Jesus hung on, Mary was there, Mary's sister, Jesus' maternal aunt, and then another Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, guys, pay attention, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her in his own home. Did you catch it? Here's the woman and her seed. All who believe in Jesus become the seed of the woman. And in this particular context, that woman is his mother. And notice her fruit is hanging on the tree. I want it to sink in. Did it sink in? Woman, there is your seed, your son. And here's the fruit of the woman hanging on the tree. Woman, your son. I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Here's the fruit, the seed of the woman. And he makes John, his follower, her seed also. Clear? Did it sink in? Because I'm done, but I want to give you a minute to let it sink in. So I'm not being Catholic or Orthodox. I'm being biblical. Just because something is embraced by, let's say, Catholicism or Orthodoxy or the Coptics doesn't mean it's wrong. And don't react and say, no, it can't be. No. Whatever they believe that's true and biblical, accept. Whatever they believe that's contrary to Scripture, reject. And same with Protestantism. I want to encourage you by the power of the Holy Spirit to be Biblicists. You with me there? One day I'll do a discussion on communion of saints, whether it's biblical. But I don't know if you can handle it. you probably get upset. But anyway, is that clear? Lord Jesus willing, I'm back in the saddle, but now I'm going to pray. I'm going to share with you my, I'm going to be public about it. Edward, that's a long discussion. I will do a session on communion of saints and what does the Bible teach about saints in heaven and whether they can hear our requests and pray for us. Just be patient, but be open to be challenged biblically. Okay, now, I'm going to leave, leave you with my dilemma now and where I need you guys to pray. <clears throat> I mentioned the beginning of the talk, so go back and listen to it. I'm going to mention it now, and it will be the last time I'll mention it. I won't mention it again, but I'm going to let you know because you're my family, and I know my detractors, those who hate me, are going to use it to slander me. That's fine. You guys know about my legal battle, unfortunately. <clears throat> I had an ex-wife that committed adultery and destroyed the marriage because of her adultery and then got a corrupt lawyer and a corrupt judge to destroy me financially. Now, my marriage was officially over November 2018, but because of a corrupt judge, she destroyed me financially and is trying to destroy me financially. This judge left me homeless and put me in $44,000 debt. Now, I tried to get another lawyer to appeal it to the appellate court to find some grace and mercy. But my ex-wife's attorneys were awarded by the judge $15,000 of the fee she's, she accrued that I have to pay. So we were contesting that. However, they went back to the same corrupt judge, and today she ordered, not only do I have to pay the $15,000 in 60 days, but because I appealed it to the appellate court and they responded, she then awarded them $25,000 on top of that that I have to pay in 30 days. Her legal fees, $40,000 in 60 days. Bar a miracle, I don't have that money, so I'm not paying it. I'm not, and I'm not worried. But that's where I need you guys to come in. You need to really, if you guys really believe that Jesus has set me apart for ministry and Jesus has anointed me to glorify him, and continue to do the work until he takes me home. Brethren, you need to fast and pray that God will fight for me and my children. 
Keep me out of this corrupt judge, corrupt court, chasing these lawyers. Set me free because I'm not paying 40000 I don't have it. I'm not paying it. So whatever happens, Lord's will be done. But I'm sharing it with you because that's where I'm at. But see, Satan thought this was going to shatter me. Guys, when that judge destroyed me again today in that court, I walked out filled with joy and peace and love of the Lord. Filled with joy and peace and love of the Lord. My ex-wife, on the other hand, not only did that adulterous relationship end, it didn't even last a year, she's more miserable than ever before. So pray for her salvation, that God will chasten her to repent, and pray God protects my children from this evil. Guys, you don't know how much joy I have right now in spite of what's happening, and I'm not afraid. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Let them do what they want. They're not getting a dime because they don't deserve it. It's her fees because of her sin. Pray the Lord protect me. All right? Can you imagine a corrupt system? Okay. Can you imagine a corrupt system? I get punished for an adulteress, and she gets rewarded for adultery and destroying my family. You know we live in an evil satanic world. But remember, he that is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And as long as Jesus loves us and we're covered by the blood of Christ, we'll be okay. But you pray that I never get locked up for this corrupt, evil, wicked judge's decisions. That I'm free to serve Jesus. Amen? I'll be back this week, I promise. This was a test because this is a new Mac. Now I know how to go live. I'll be teaching more by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love you guys. And by the way, if you guys have questions and you're local, I'm going to give you my telephone number. Okay? Because the best way to get me to answer your questions is to text me and talk to me on the phone. So here, guys, I'm going to give you my number. And if there we have trolls who want to call me, I'll block you. 224-565-7809. 224-565-7809. And guys, do pray for me that God helps me to get healthier and holier and to find a godly partner. It's hard being alone. But I know the Lord has someone. And I have someone in mind. I won't mention her name. The Lord knows. Just pray for her. Pray for that, that God will confirm it. Sophia, it's okay. They can have my number. What are they going to do? Come and kill me? They set me free. If they're trolls, I'll block them. Don't worry, Sophia. Jesus protects us. Okay? But anyway, there is someone in mind. Ask the Lord to show me and make it clear so I don't make another mistake. Okay? Take care, guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed, and I love you for the sake of the Lord. I'm going to leave this on. not going to delete it. Go back and listen to it. We love you, Jesus.